good to be in the house of God on this Sabbath day. Um, God impressed a few things in my heart um, for the last couple of weeks when I knew I was going to preach. So I've got a simple message and I hope by God's spirit that you receive it. Okay. Thank you, guys. Here we are at the foot of the Mount of Transfiguration Stadium. The manager has set his team up in, the, in his usual 4-4-2 formation. In goal, we have Nathaniel Bartholomew. This is a man who wears his heart on his sleeve and is a safe pair of hands. He has not let any goals in since the manager arrived. The manager saw him even before he came to him and snapped him up in the last transfer window. At right back, we have James Alpheus, or James Deles, as he's sometimes known. This is a player who doesn't draw attention to himself, but he just cracks on with the game. At left back, we have Julius Thaddeus, another player who keeps a low profile. He's the workhorse for the team and will run himself to the ground. In central defense, we have a new defensive pairing of Judas Iscariot, a man known to score the occasional own goal, and Thomas Didymus, who has gone on record to say that he doesn't really trust the manager. Many analysts doubt that this central defense pairing will work. Thomas has to make sure that he continues to believe in the manager and his strategy and that he does not hang his head when things get tough. The manager has employed a fluid midfield. Philip was acquired in the deal that brought in Nathaniel Bartholomew and is defense-minded. He will cover every blade of grass to get the job done. As will Simon Zelot, a midfield general. I expect that he'll be playing in front of the back four in what was called the, the Claude Makalele role. Andrew was the first player to be signed by the manager, and he will be one of the two attacking midfielders today. The other will be Simon Peter, who's also the captain of the team, and a player known to be very vocal on the pitch. Simon Peter is known or is prone to the occasional rush tackle and has already been yellow carded this season. He'll need to keep his temper in check and do what he does best. He, that is, being the creative engine that drives the team. He'll be employed in the number 10 role behind the two strikers. The manager has employed a twin strikers, a team strikers or twin strikers even, that of, of James and John Zebedee, nicknamed the Thunder Boys. Both these men have a mean streak in them that will strike fear into the heart of every defense. John has struck a good re relationship with the manager, and bo but both strikers have to be careful not to be yellow carded today because they are one booking away from suspension. On the bench, we have the South American, Mateo um, Pablico. He has uh, just been signed by the manager and he's not playing today because the they're still investigating his tax scandals. Now over to the guys on the on peace side. Inju and Yinka, what do you think about today's lineup? Well, easy game, I think, walk in the park. Any game that has James, Peter, John could win any team at any time. This should be a very, very easy game to win. I see a solid team here, the Thunder Boys, you know, they are on the way to become the, uh, the, the joint top goal scorers. Then Nathaniel Bartholomew is in line to become the record of uh, 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 most clean sheets as well. You have Judas Iscariot and um, Thomas Didymus holding the back line. They are so tough and they've been, so, uh, they've been doing that since the manager came, came in. And, you know, of course, you can't miss Simon Peter who orchestrates the defense and the attack and makes sure that the, 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 the game moves so quickly. So I think this should be an easy win for them anyway. Well, the teams are finally out, and we can have a look at them. Unusually injured, these disciples are not going through their normal pre-game warm-up. Yeah, wait a minute. I think there's a problem somewhere. There's no warm-up. There's no prayer. No fasting. No Bible study. No small groups. Who do they think they are? They just think they can walk up and win anybody at any time. In fact, there are only eight players on the pitch. Where is Peter? He's not even here. Where is James? Not even here either. Who do they think they are, Yinka? 
the, the manager is known, you know, to do some, some things, but it's not even on the touchline this time. You know, this is very strange. Normally, the, the manager walks with them out on the pitch and makes sure that everything is in order, or maybe there's a, a player injured, you know, and we, we don't even have uh, Simon on the pitch as well. But wait a minute, I can see Judas pushing Simeon de Zilliot on the chest. That's quite interesting. You know, they're trying to break them off now, and there's p fingers point. They need to get themselves together, you know. I don't understand what's going on. Yeah. It should be an easy game anyway. That's a really serious problem. There are no referees yet, but there's a big chance somebody could be sent off even before the game begins. Well, I'm hearing that the manager and the front three players have left this, they've left the stadium altogether. Yes, the manager and the front three players have left the stadium, I'm hearing. I, I cannot believe this. I think the news has even reached the, the away fans. There's a lot of groaning and complaining. Well, I, I can understand why, because they've paid a lot of, of money for these away tickets. Yinka. I'm, I'm hearing that, you know, they must have heard about this, these players. And I think that's the reason why Judas wants to become number nine. I don't understand. He's a defensive guy. I don't know why he wants to become a number nine player again. Well, D D D Judas is a defense player. Surely he's not a striker. Inju, do you think that a bit of complacency has set in on the heart of the manager? Oh, Brian, what can I say? I, what can I really say? What can I say? <laughs> It seems it seem shocking, but one, one thing you should know is that they've been trained by a very excellent manager. Mm -hmm. He has never lost any game ever. And it doesn't matter if there are four players on the pitch or there are six players on the pitch. I, so, I have so much confidence that the manager will put them through. A final word from you, Yinka? And I think the manager is known for his radical approach. He knows how to you know, face these things with no problem. But the thing about this is... The favor is still with the disciples. So, you know what, we can go with it. Even with eight, with seven men, they can still destroy anything. This should still be an easy win anyway. We're hearing that uh, Matthew is on the bench. Is, is that normal, Inju? Can they start with eight men? There's nothing in the rule book that says there has to be 11 players on the pitch, even 12. But one thing about this team and about the manager is that he can deal with any opposition, be it with two men, four men, six men it does that's not the problem the maintenance is that the manager is there and this should be a very easy game to win thank you it should have been an easy win shall we pray father god speak to us through me in jesus name amen there they were at the foot of the mount of transfiguration jesus this had the habit of going up to the mountains to pray. This wasn't an unusual thing. But on this occasion, he did something different. He took Peter, James, and John with him up to the mountain. This highly angered the remaining nine disciples. They felt left behind. They felt unloved. They felt cheated. They felt that their ambitions were crushed. All the disciples at this time one thought that Jesus was coming to set up an earthly kingdom. And what they wanted was to be... Um, to, to be the rulers. They wanted to be Jesus in a cabinet. And there he was picking Peter, James, and John. And they fell behind. And they were really unhappy. There, there was a spirit of competition in their hearts. They grumbled and they complained. I mean, it was a good thing that they wanted to do, to go up to the mountaintop to pray. It is a good thing to want to go up to the mountain to, to pray with Jesus. But from their perspective, they thought, they thought of this as a career move. They thought it would be great to go up into the mountain to pray and to be considered one with Jesus. Thank you. Not everyone needs to go up to the mountain or go up the mountain at the same time, though. Would you agree? It's good to go up to the mountain, but not everybody needs to go up at the same time. When Jesus took the three up the mountain, he took them up there for a reason because he had a special mission for those three and he wanted them to understand what he was going to go through. And, and, so, and when he left the nine at the foot of the mountain, he had confidence in them that he had trained them, that he had taught them the, the strategies to, 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 to employ in the, in the game of winning souls. You know, sometimes when God leaves you in the valley, it's because he actually has confidence in you. He, he's, he's given you enough for you to be able to carry on and do what you need to do. You know, sometimes I, I watch football. Um, that's why I thought of this metaphor. I watch a lot football on TV. And 
And one of the things that I'm always curious about is you watch the subs on the bench, and you can tell which subs are ready to play. Okay, they have their kit on, they are, they are focused on the game. Some subs on the game, they just sit there, totally bored, disinterested, and not part of the, of the whole thing, as if detached. Okay, this is how the disciples were. They were not in it with Jesus. They were angry. They were detached from the whole affairs. They were, they were absolutely disconnected. Jesus was up in the mountain receiving glory, being glorified, and down at the foot of the mountain, the disciples were disgruntled. But let's not judge them too harshly, though. Are we any different? How do you react when the same brother or the same sister keeps getting asked to do things in church? How react or how you react is an indicator of how you'd have reacted had you been with the disciples. The preacher said, there's nothing new under the sun in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. How things have happened a particular way in the past, and, and things keep repeating themselves. The church and Jesus were separated not only by proximity, by proximity, but also in religious experience, as I've said. This scene, to this scene of the disciples complaining at the foot of the mountain, I'm very conscious of the time, came a father bringing his son. And the boy's father was concerned about his son. He had searched everywhere. He had heard about Jesus um, healing the sick and curing um, people from every condition and malaise. And, and he had taken care of it. And he had gone from place to place. He had seen that Jesus wasn't there. He had gone to another place and Jesus wasn't there. Then he finally heard that Jesus was at the, at, at the Mount of Transfiguration. And he went there with his boy. He wanted his boy to be healed because the boy was possessed of a demon, doing everything that he needed to do. He was concerned about his son. This father brought his son to Jesus. When was the last time? Are there any fathers in the house? Any fathers? Any fathers? Well, I see a, a, pr a proud young father over there feeding his, his son. Okay. When was the last time you brought your son or your daughter to Jesus? Many parents take the children to ballet, to football, will do piano lessons, will take them swimming. But how many actually bring them to Jesus? This father was so concerned for his son and his condition, the condition that he was in, that he brought, them to, he brought him to Jesus. And this father came to Jesus with certain expectations. He expected Jesus to deliver his son from the demon that possessed him. Do you come to Jesus with an expectation? I know the English say that you generally get what you expect. Faith is, is designed to raise yours and my expectation. We need to have a measure of faith that comes to God with an expectation. When you come to worship God in the Sabbath, on a Sabbath, it should be with an expectation that we'll receive from God and he'll work through us. The father came seeking Jesus, but when he came to the foot of the mountain, Jesus wasn't there. The father found the disciples instead. And this is what happens. When people come to the house of God, they come here expecting to see Jesus. And what they see is me. And what they see is you. The, the, and there's an expectation from, from people and from the, from the Father that can... Let me reverse it. When the Father saw the disciples, he expected the disciples to be able to do what Jesus could do. Was that fair? Was that a fair, a, a, a fair expectation? A disciple is an apprentice. What does an apprentice do? I've shared this. An, a, an apprentice studies the master and copies the method of the master until he can create whatever, be it a, 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 a table, a lectern, to, to the standard of the master. So, when the, so the, the disciple should have been well able to deliver that boy from the demon. And the father was entitled to come and expect that. And uh, what I find uh, strange about this story is that uh, when, the, when you read further in, in and sorry, the chapters, the verses should have been up. This story is from uh, Mark 9, Luke 17, I mean Matthew 17 and Luke 9, if you want to, to read it afterwards. I went too fast with the slide. What, what, what I find strange is that when the father came to Jesus later on in the story, he explained to the father that, that, that the, the demon 
or the, the demon had been possessed or the child had been possessed by a demon from a young age. He said from a child. And some Bible says from an infant or as a young child. And that actually made me scared because he showed me that. I know we preach that God is not a, a respecter of persons, but it seems like the devil is not a respecter of persons either. He said your, your, your little child, your little baby is, is fair game. Whatever spirit is tormenting your child, you need, that, you need to bring that child to Jesus. So, on with the story. The father brings, brings the child to the disciples, the, and the father expects the disciples to cast the demon out, and, and, and he brings this, this, the, the child to the disciples. Now, earlier in uh, Luke 9, 1 to 6, the, the disciples, Jesus had sent the, the 12 out. He had called the 12 and he'd given them power and authority over evil spirits. And they were able to heal. They had cast demons before. Now, these disciples thought that this, is, this was a, a skill. Like you learn how to, I used to play basketball. The disciples thought that it, it was a skill. So once, obviously, you have played basketball a few times and you've shot, you shot hoops a few times, you get to know how to dribble the ball and everything. They thought, oh, we've been given this skill now. We can cast demons. They, didn't re they forgot or they didn't realize that they were only able to cast demons while they were connected to Jesus. So the father brings the boy to the disciples and, and, and says, please, help my son. Obviously, Judas Iscariot goes first and says, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of the boy. The child screams, ah! rolls on the ground, and the demon remains in them. And then the other disciples say to him, I can imagine Simon the Zealot said, the problem with you, Judas, is that you are not forceful enough. You have to do this in a forceful manner. He walks up to the boy. In the name of Jesus, come out of the boy. The demon threw the boy into the air. He landed flat on his back. And then the, others, the, the other disciples came. Thaddeus says, do you know what your problem is? You should be kneeling while you cast out this demon. So Thaddeus goes on his knees and says, in the name of Jesus, come out of this boy. The demon threw, rolled the boy in the ground. He, ch he chucked him on the floor. The boy is screaming. And every time the church is trying to heal the boy in his own power, yeah. the boy is getting hurt yeah. and injured and bruised. Because the church without Jesus can hurt somebody. If I as a Christian try to operate in this church without the Spirit of, 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 the, Holy, of, the, of the, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, I'm bound to rub somebody off in the wrong way. When we come to God's house, we have to submit ourselves to His Spirit so that we, that way we can relate to, to one another without causing any friction. The boy is hurt, he's, he's, he's bouncing up and down, and the father is disappointed. The father had come to the church with expectations. And these expectations were disappointed. Now, the, this, wasn't, this story didn't happen in a vacuum. You have the scribes and Pharisees. You have the home team who were supporting the disciples and Jesus. And you have the away team who were actually scary, who were actually in enemy or in opposition to Jesus and the, and the disciples. So when the disciples fail now, all the, all the people that are the enemies, the scribes and the Pharisees are booing, boo, boo, rubbish. And, and even the home team is going, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing. And everybody is, is screaming and there's pandemonium and the name of Jesus is being brought into disrepute because when the team is failing on the pitch, people tend to look at the manager and they're saying, fire the manager, we want another manager. This is rubbish. You guys can't, do, you can't perform on the pitch. Suddenly, somebody cries out, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. Everybody turns around and they, they see Jesus coming um, down from the mountain. You can almost hear that. Ah, as, as, it's, as Jesus and the, and the three disciples come down the mountain. And there's a glow about his head because he's been in contact with the Father, Son, and the, uh, with, with, the, with the Spirit while, uh, while he was transfigured. Even the disciples who are with him have this glow about them. The, the scribes move forward and then, then they are scared because they, they, are, they are sinful in the house. They cannot stand the glory of God. All the people who are pure in the house who really love Jesus rush towards Jesus. It says that the whole crowd rushed towards Jesus. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, who was just sent to stage a few minutes before? Who was being flung through, to and fro? 
the little boy. But it's, the, it's, not, it's, it's not the little boy who gets to Jesus first. It's the whole crowd that we're watching him being flung, fl being flung around. And it made me think, is it possible that in our rushing towards Jesus as adults in the church that we, 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 we leave the little boys and little girls behind? It's all about me. Let me get my Jesus fixed. Yeah. Can I speak frankly? I will anyway. I mean, I, I've been mic'd up. The crowd runs towards Jesus. I just want to share an observation. Um, in this church, right, we have Bible study in the, in the afternoon. That's a good thing. We have a, uh, an afternoon service. That's a good thing. But what I'm sensing and what I've realized is that these programs are, are, are geared for which demographic? Which demographic? What, what part of the church are the afternoon services um, suited for? Anybody in the house? The adults, yeah. Okay. So every afternoon, Jesus comes down from the mountain. We, we behold his glory and we rush towards Jesus and we leave all the children behind. Leave me alone. Let me get my Jesus fixed right now. We, this shouldn't be, we sh shouldn't be like that. We should take the children along with us to see Jesus. The father did. Jesus looks at the scribes and Pharisees who had been arguing and screaming at the disciples and said, Hey, what are you arguing with them about? The father who had been disappointed by the disciples, doesn't give up. He screams out, Dear Jesus, I need you. Have mercy on me. And actually the Bible says he goes and kneels at Jesus' feet and says, Dear Jesus, have mercy on me. I, my son, please help us. The father identified with a boy's problem. The father said, Please help us. My son is possessed of a demon that throws him all over the place and he's been like that since he was a child. I came to your disciples, I came to the church, but the church couldn't heal him. Jesus addresses the scribes, but it is the Father who speaks up. The Father had initially come to see Jesus, and now that Jesus was here, he was going to seize his moment. When it comes to Jesus, you need to seize your moment. Jesus had time to hear this Father. There was a whole crowd rushing towards him, but Jesus had the cry of one father. He goes to the disciples. Oh, you guys, how long shall I be with you? You perverse and unbelieving generation. Now, I looked up the word perverse. Okay, or well, maybe let's take it a step back. Who has a CV here? I have a CV. Who has a CV? Okay. You know, that there's a section in your CV where you describe yourself. Somebody fire some words at me. When you describe yourself in your CV, what do you say? I am hardworking, reliable, a team worker, team player. Okay, who puts in their CV perverse? I am perverse. I am faithless. I am unbelieving. Okay, why do we put all those positive things in our CV? Because we want to be regarded in a positive light. Okay, who's ever heard of a 360 appraisal? Yeah, it's a painful thing, isn't it? Because a 360 appraisal is when other people anonymously give their proper view of you. Yeah, it's, it's not negative. It's, it's a proper, this is what, how you come across to us. It's a painful thing. Now, Jesus was giving these guys the 360 appraisals right there. You perverse and faithless and unbelieving generation. Bring the boy to me. He brings a boy, by one, one, and, and, and the, the boy comes to him. But what I, what I find um, crazy about this story is that as the boy is coming to him, the demon takes him one last time, flings him in the air, and slams him to the ground. And this is the boy. The, the, the boy is approaching Jesus, right? The demon has the nerve, the goal, to slam him to the ground. And, and, and I thought about that phrase. I, I said to you earlier, I used to, to play basketball. Now, I started playing basketball when I was 16, and, and I only played basketball because I used to play rugby before, and I grew to six foot one at about 16, and the basketball coach says, see you at basketball training. I look, I'd never played basketball in my life, but that was it. When Mr. Maynard, well, he was the PE teacher, and he had caned me with his um, cricket bat a few times because I had forgot my swimming kit. I went to, to a school in Zimbabwe, and if you forgot your swimming kit, you, you just got whacked and you had to swim in your school shorts. So when Mr. Maynard said to me, you turning up for basketball, I turned up for basketball. But I started watching basketball videos, and one of the things that I liked uh, and aspired to do was to dunk. 
or to slam the ball into the net. Okay, so I would watch videos of, of uh, it was Magic Johnson then and the, and the LA Lakers and then it was Jordan and Jordan would be flying and he would be slamming the ball into the net and I wanted to do that. But then I analyzed, when I thought about this, just analyze the slam. What is the point of the dunk or the slam? When you dunk, whether you shoot the ball from within the three-point line is two points. If you do a layup, it's two points. So what's the point of the dunk? If you slam the ball in the hoop, it's two points. But wh why do people dunk then? Yeah. Because it's the impact. It's a crowd pleaser. I wanted to dunk because I wanted the, that acclimation. And I remember my first dunk. We were playing against the school. My friend Gino had just been fouled. And I was angry because, I could, uh, because he'd been fouled. And I got the ball on a breakaway. And it just got there. Wow. wow. And then I went to the opposition bench and just went like that. Yeah. <laughs> Why did I do that? I was showing off, yeah? I wanted to show them, well, who do you think you are? Why are you going to foul my friend and hurt my friend? Yeah, I've just dunked on you. Okay, so that demon now, the boy is approaching Jesus. What does the demon do? He takes the boy and just slams him to the ground. Because the demon is trying to say to Jesus, who do you think you are? Watch me, right? I'm, look, did you see what I did? And do you know what Jesus said? Come out of him. And don't you ever go into him again. And the demon left the boy. Jesus has authority over every situation that you or your child or your family may be going through. He's not in awe. He's not overawed. The devil may come and do his little dunk dance, his slam dance, but Jesus, Jesus is not concerned. He says, come out of him and don't you ever go into him again. Now the disciples were really disappointed, right? And they were crestfallen. So they go, they go to the house with Jesus afterwards. And, and they asked him, Jesus, why couldn't, why couldn't we cast the demon out? And you know, I like the attitude of the disciples. They had a deficit. They had a problem. They had something missing in their life. And they took the time to ask to address that. Now, I, I, I think part of my problem, I'm going to talk about myself. Part of my problem, right, is that when I look in the mirror, I tell myself that everything is all right. Yeah. Why do, how did Jesus address them? He addressed them as perverse, unbelieving, and faithless. But when they looked in the mirror, they thought, well, I'm, I'm Judas Iscariot. I, I, I know I'm the central defender, but I could be a striker. I'm Peter. I'm the, I'm the spokesperson. And part of my problem, and, and may I, may I, may I uh, suggest that part of your problem might be that when you and I look in the mirror, we don't see ourselves as Jesus sees us. But after their failure, the disciples were brought to a realization that they were not perfect. They didn't have this sorted out. So they go to Jesus and said, why couldn't we do this? And he said to them, this much comes by prayer. And other versions, I think it's Matthew, says, and fasting. This much comes by prayer and fasting. If you want to have victory over your situation, whether it is demonic possession, whether it is employment problems, whether it is attitude, whether it is arrogance, yeah, whether it is whatever, you need to take some time in private prayer with Jesus. Jesus would go wake up early in the morning to power up. Ruth. Jesus would go early in the morning to power up. And every morning... He would get this energy to, for the rest of the day, and the energy came by the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus met that boy, he wasn't surprised that he met, he met the boy because he already spent time with the Spirit. This afternoon, my appeal is simple. Uh, is there anybody that, that needs to get into the habit of prayer? Yeah. That, my appeal is simple. I found this um, quotation in the book Step to Christ, the, and on the chapter, The Privilege of Prayer, and it says... Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but it brings us up to him. Okay. I, I'm, Ruth is going to sing a song. Here's my heart. And if there's anybody that would like us or would like us to pray for. If you have an issue that you need us to pray for, this is the moment, this is the hour. Please feel free to come up so we can pray. I'm done.
This is our prayer. This is our heart, dear Father. Father, we need to speak to you, O Lord, and to wait and hear your voice speaking to us, O Lord. And dear Lord, we each come before you, dear Father, with burdens, with cares, with difficulties and challenges. But we know Christ has overcome the world. And we thank you, O Lord, and we thank you, O oh Lord, for the victory and the promise, dear Lord, that you will carry us till the end. Help us, O oh Lord, 
in this difficult journey we find ourselves in. We give you glory and honor, O oh Father. And because of you, O oh Lord, we know there is an arm that we can cling through, O oh Father. Help us not to trust in the arm of flesh, but to trust in the all-powerful, almighty God here in heaven and on earth. We give you thanks, O oh Father, for every soul that has come forward, dear Father. Dear Lord, you know the different things that they are going through in their lives, dear Father. And we pray, dear Lord, that you answer in your way and in your time. Thank you, O oh Father, for hearing our prayers. And bless us on this Sabbath day. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.